It is so good to join together in worship. In a time when we cannot yet be together, but when we desperately need our communities, we give thanks for these shared moments that connect us to one another in heart and in spirit. If you'd like to follow along with our worship guide this morning, there's a link provided here. We also encourage you to use our worship guide as a way of keeping up with our weekly events and the prayer requests from within our community. Let me remind you that we have adult Sunday school classes that meet weekly at 10 a.m. This week, we will also kick off our Thursday night study called What is Black Theology, where our own James Blay will lead us through a provocative and thoughtful introduction to black theology, discussing the ways that black theology must inform our faith and our reading of scripture. The links to all of our virtual gatherings are listed in our weekly emails. You can sign up to receive our emails using a link at the top of our worship guide. If you have a little one worshiping with you this morning, we have a family worship experience also available for you in the worship guide. Here you can find information about our family opportunities, including our upcoming Advent workshop and our Christmas family gathering. This morning we continue in our fall sermon series, Evolve. These weeks of worship have encouraged us to remember who we have been, to recognize who we are, and to make space for who we are becoming. Words like help, know, yes, evolve, thanks, guide us as we reflect. This morning we invite you to breathe, to inhale the breath of God's Spirit, and to exhale all that you have carried with you this week. As you inhale, consider the ways that God's love continues to breathe new life through you. And as you exhale, remember that we too can breathe new life over the world and the lives that surround us. As we turn our hearts to worship, Join with me in a pastoral prayer for God's children and the world. O oh God, with a single breath, you set the universe in motion. By a word, you established life. You gave purpose. You breathed goodness, and love burst into being. With your very hands, you sculpted mountain, mountains. You placed the stars. You crafted the horizon. From your handiwork came beauty and abundance of it. From the depths of yourself, you imagined a universe in communion with you and each other. You envisioned for us a place where we would all know the fullness of love and grace, of peace and justice. Holy Creator, you spoke forth love and life flourished. We also use words, God, but more often it is for harm. We breathe out too careless with our words. Our hands are busy, but not always for beauty's sake. You have extended your hands in acts of healing. Our hands bear destruction and division. Our imaginations are at work too, but in ways that create a world where some lives are more valuable than others. Forgive us, God, all of us, and guide us into a new way of being. Show us, O oh God, how our words can bring life. As you have so many times before, speak life now over our barren souls. Breathe resurrection over our weary bodies. Show us, O oh God, how our hands can craft goodness and beauty. With your healing mercy, touch our broken world that we might have a renewed vision for your kingdom. Show us, O oh God, how our imaginations can nurture a depth of love that brings wholeness and that offers life. We pray these things trusting in your faithful love. 
Amen. Sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let the rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your Beloved, over the past couple of weeks, 
the world has called you into the voting booth to decide which candidate should run this country. Today, you are called into this service of worship and in a few moments to the Lord's table to decide once more who will run your life. So let us put away our swords and our sound bites. Let us drop our rocks and our nets. Let us come to this time as one, not just for the rich and powerful, but for the broken. Today is a day for remembering, remembering all that unites us, remembering that strong identity we share with everyone, moving forward together as children of God. With this in heart and mind, let us worship.
It is my great pleasure and honor to speak about one of this year's recipients of the Servant Leadership Award, my good friend, Susan Phillips. Susan is retired after working for 30 years in Guilford County school system, first at Sedalia and Millis Road Elementary Schools, teaching first and second grades, and later working in administration. She also served as an adjunct professor for five years at Greensboro College, where she taught methods classes in reading, math, and social studies for candidates majoring in teacher education and for potential lateral entry teachers. Because of her excellence and extensive experience in the classroom, Susan was selected to serve in the Department, Professional, Department of Professional Development of Guilford County Schools. In this position, she interviewed prospective teachers and served as a mentor for new teachers, providing invaluable one-on-one -on -one support for some, from someone who knew what it was like to face a room full of six and seven-year-olds. More important was the responsibility to help the first-year teachers feel successful, to keep the spark lit, and to reach their highest potential, a vital position in which Susan excelled. Outside the classroom, she, she has served three terms and continues to serve on the advisory board to the North Carolina State Employees Credit Union. Susan has been equally dedicated to serving in many capacities at College Park, once again teaching small children in a class about the various parts of a worship service. She taught Sunday school for second and third graders and kept the nursery for babies and toddlers on a regular basis. For many years, she has volunteered to give this children's sermon during the 11 o'clock mosaic service. And on Sundays when she was not volunteering with the children, she attended the Pathfinders class. During the, ne nearly 20 near during the nearly 20 years she has been at College Park, Susan has served as a deacon several times and twice as chair, been on the personnel committee for two terms and been the chair once, and been on the celebrations committee and was chair once. Many times she has volunteered on the casserole committee, the bereavement committee, meet and greet, and served Sunday night dinner at Greensboro Urban Ministry. Susan has also served on the flocker committee, a group who, in the dead of night, planted trees, planted pink flamingos in the front yard of church members who had a birthday ending in a zero. The group referred to their leader as the mother flocker. Susan has a very noble avocation about which she is most passionate. For many years, she has volunteered with Carolina Boxer Rescue, going on home visits to evaluate if people qualify to adopt or foster a boxer. She also transports boxers to their foster or forever homes and sometimes even other rescues. She and Kim are the proud parents of Roxy, their own boxer. Susan's long resume of service to her church and community symbolizes her dedication to goodness and her high regard for her fellow man. I could list a multitude of adjectives, but a familiar Southern expression says it all. Susan, you are good people. I'm sure everyone at College Park joins me in offering you heartfelt congratulations on this much deserved recognition. A Blessing of Hope by Jan Richardson. Now, more than ever, let us be the ones who will not turn away. Let us be the ones who will go farther into the wreck and deeper into the rubble. Let us be the ones who will enter into the places of devastation beyond belief and despair beyond our imagining. And there, let us listen for the spirit that brooded over the formless darkness and there let us look again for the God who gathered up the chaos and began to create. Let us be the ones who will give ourselves to the work of making again and to the endless beginning of creation.
let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Neighbor, let me be your servant. Grant us, Lord, your greater vision of how life was meant to be. The mosaic shaped and colored by our blessed community, where our thoughts and views may differ, love's design is be. Just echoes of our own. Philippians one twenty seven. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. Romans 12, 9-21 Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Laura Webb's three-year-old daughter asked her mom when she was going to stop watching the map show which is a really good question here on day plus five of the election. I appreciate you stopping your doom scrolling long enough to hang out with the good people of College Park. As the votes are being tallied and people are afraid, devastated, and disheartened, where in this nation's one person's dream is another person's nightmare, I remember the words of Annie Dillard, what can one say that does not enrage by its triviality? I will try not to say anything stupid or unhelpful, but no promises. When I was 10 years old in 1968, we were living in the home that we would live in off and on for the next eight years. The suburb is called Del Cerro, and the unfortunate name of our subdivision was 
Princess Del Cero, which no one ever called it that, but instead referred to it as Baja Del Cero, literally down the hill, which we thought sounded more exotic. My parents' polling place was a garage at someone's house about 15 houses down and just around the curve. I remember following them on my red, huffy Stingray bike. The late 60s was a boom time for kids on bikes, and watching them as they went into some stranger's garage and voted. No line, no big deal, lots of greetings and laughter. The everydayness of that moment and the neighborly goodwill around it stick with me still. My father voted for Nixon being so disappointed that LBJ, his favorite president ever, wasn't running. Mom voted for Humphrey and taunted her husband with the idea that she canceled out his vote. They were not ideologues. They once explained to me their political philosophy. They tried to figure out which candidate was the most self-serving and greedy, and then they would vote for the other candidate. Often their votes were not for someone as much as they were against the other. A dad guessed wrong on Nixon, as he would later admit. So it goes. I'm not trying to see 1968 through the rosy lens of a 10-year-old. It was a terrible year. The Tet Offensive, Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy assassinated. Hardly a week went by without reports of bombings and arson attacks from the left and the right. In Mississippi, the KKK bombed a synagogue. Anti-race, anti-war radicals burned files at a military draft center in Maryland. That fall, there were 41 anti-war bombings and arson attacks on college campuses. The culture war in 68 was largely about race. A white supremacist murdered black America's strongest voice for equality and grace. At the Olympics, black-fisted gloves held up by two African-American athletes for all the world to see asserted a new dynamic in the country's oldest and deepest conflict. In America's cities, blacks demanded access to their share of political power, economic opportunity, and cultural visibility. For six weeks in Washington, protesters inspired by King's call for a poor people's campaign camped out on the mall in tents and shacks, rechristening the space as Resurrection City and demanding that the government create anti-poverty programs. America's center did not hold, as it does not now. But 220 is giving 1968 a run for the title, The Year That America Unraveled. I find some consolation and encouragement by the words of the great American theologian, Reinhard Niebuhr, who took into account both the grandeur and the sinfulness of humanity. He once said, People's capacity for good makes democracy possible. People's inclination to evil makes democracy necessary. There is an interesting sentence in Paul's letter to his friends in Philippi. Philippi was a prominent Roman colony, and the civil language, the civic language, was part of the lingua franca. Paul wrote, let your manner of life, your politics, your citizenship be worthy of Christ. The Greek word is where we get our word politics. So what might that mean for us today in America post-election? How can our manner of life, our citizenship, be worthy of the gospel of Christ? The truest answer is, I don't know. But let me put forth a couple of ideas that might spark some more considerations with you and yours. And here I'm following some of the thoughts of my seminary pastor, Stephen Shoemaker. Maybe the first thing to say on this confusing and troubling Sunday after the cluster of an election is that our primary allegiance is to Christ and our citizenship is in God's eternal love. So, 
we get into trouble when being Republican or Democrat is more crucial than our baptism. Later in this letter, Paul went on to suggest that we Christians have a dual citizenship in God's reign. But our citizenship, our parlima, is in heaven, and it's from there we are expecting a healer, a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word literally means our commonwealth. Philippi as a Roman was a as a Roman colony under the emperor expected people to say Jesus is Lord. Descent is a deeply Christian value, one we Baptists in particular cherish. There is a church building in Greensboro that has three flagpoles in front of their sanctuary. In the center is the tallest one with the American flag, with the so-called Christian flag on one side slightly lower, and the North Carolina flag on the other slightly lower pole on the other side. Sometimes I think when I pass it by Jesus in North Carolina, tied for second. A second thing to say is that we Baptist Christians cherish the deeply American principle of the separation of church and state. The First Amendment of our Constitution carved it into our civic life. There it is, freedom of religion and freedom from religion, too, alongside the freedoms of speech, of press, and of assembly. We are always tempted to trash this principle. The church craves the power of the state for its moral purposes. The state is greedy for the church's support to receive its political ends. There's much more that needs to be said about how sacred we Baptists view this wall between church and state, to use Jefferson's phrase, and how we were so instrumental in its creation. But that's another sermon for another time. So what might that mean for all of us at College Park? Well, we, your ministers, are given by you a free pulpit. So all of us are free to articulate moral and ethical issues as we see them relating to political issues. And on the other hand, we honor the free pew in which you sat before the Rona, your right to disagree. And for this reason, we're extremely careful taking a position on, as a church on political issues, such as the church did in supporting the February 1 uh, 1960 sit-in of Woolworths and of our opposition to Amendment 1 and HB 2 a few years ago. And we will never advocate for our members to vote for a particular candidate. But we will speak out boldly on moral issues in the political realm, whomever is leading us politically. We encourage our members to express their values in the political realm without dictating what you should do. We help our members announce opportunities for such expression, like the recent book discussions on Just Mercy and the info by Sandra Westervelt on the Innocence Project. Outside the church, of course, each of you have a free pulpit as priests of God into the world. You can and you often do exercise that free pulpit, letting your conscience speak. God calls us to go into the public square and give voice, voice to our most cherished moral convictions. A responsible church does not dictate a certain single moral response. We help our congregants think through our moral commitments and to flex our moral muscles. A third thought. Christians should recognize that one of the greatest political acts they can be a part of is to be the church. That is to embody the radical kingdom of God in the middle of all the other world's kingdoms, of, all of this world's kingdoms. Duke professor Stanley Hauerwas wrote that being the church as the formation of a people constituted by virtues necessary to endure the struggle to hear and to speak truthfully to one another. We can only be such a place if wanting to be right is less important than wanting to be truthful. 
it's significant that this month we are awarding this Servant Leadership Award to two outstanding women. And the scripture that defines that award is Philippians 2, 4 to 5. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Susan and Susie continue to live out this mandate. We do lots of things here to repair the world, both in our everyday jobs and in our free time. We have scads of teachers, attorneys, nurses, therapists, community organizers, firefighters, social workers, business people, professor, professors, and even a vet or two, all of whom are working hard to be Jesus' body in the world. And of course, we have lots of members who are feeding, healing, teaching, helping everyone they can in their path. Fourthly, when we do enter the public square, we should do so with humility. We can claim the truth we've been given, but we never claim to have all the truth. Our convictions are tempered by a spiritual humility. We acknowledge that we could be wrong, but our humility should never lead us to timidity. Instead, our humility just keeps our conviction from morphing into arrogance. My last point, when Jesus commanded his followers to love our enemies, this includes our political opponents and those who voted differently than you did. I think this will be difficult for many of us. I know I have lost friends over this election, a couple that I've had for over 40 years. This is a time in which we are getting more polarized in America, but a church like College Park can be a safe haven for diverse political and moral opinions. We're a congregation with a generous amount of theological diversity, more than most I know. Can this be a hallmark of our witness that College Park is a place where liberals and conservatives or Democrats and Republicans can worship and work together, talking face-to-face -face about what is crucial to them? If that's to happen, then we must take special care to honor understand, and listen to those who take different positions. It's no secret that I'm on the left on many issues. So I'll have to continue to take special care to those members on the right. But this is my pledge. I and my colleagues will be ministers and pastors to all in our congregation, no matter what your political or religious persuasion. This election was a national embarrassment. It shouldn't have been this close, not after caging children, not after so many outrageous lies, not after selling out our soldiers, not after 237,000 dead from the Rona, not after four years of breaking every law in the books. And things are going to get worse before they start getting better. But so many Americans did vote this time, putting to rest finally the debate if any one person's vote counts. My hero, and probably yours too, Re Representative John Lewis, said in a 2012 speech in Charlotte, My dear friends, your vote is precious, almost sacred. It is the most powerful, nonviolent tool we have to create a more perfect union. He also said, I want to see young people in the world feel the spirit of the 1960s and find a way to get in the way. Oh, to find a way to get into trouble. Good trouble. Necessary trouble. Good, necessary trouble. That, my friends, is the way of a citizenship worthy of the gospel of Christ. Today I must agree with Princeton professor Eddie Glaude that says, race continues to confound, confound this democracy. It is our original sin that still divides the nation. Our work dismantling the systemic racism in our culture and the deep biases and racism that exist in ourselves continues as it should. We have much more work to do than what some of us may have thought. Former White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon suggested Thursday morning that Dr. Anthony Fauci and FBI Director Christopher Wray should be beheaded. 
I'm not making this up. His comments were posted and made in a video posted to his Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter accounts. Bannon fan falsely claimed President Trump had won re-election despite several key states being too close to call and that he should fire both Fauci and Ray. Then he said he would go further. Quote, I'd put their heads on pikes. Right, I'd put them at the two corners of the White House as a warning to federal bureaucrats. You either get with the program or you are gone. Big yikes on that one. A national leader wanting to go all medieval on fellow Americans. He and others are letting the dogs of hate off the leash. Contrast that with Senator John McCain's concession speech on 5th of November 2008, just 12 years ago, but what seems like another era in America. Back then, Republicans nominated people with character and class. This is statesmanship at its best. He said, Senator Obama and I have argued our differences and he has prevailed. No doubt many of those differences remain. These are difficult times for our country. And I pledge to him tonight to do all in my power to help him lead us through the many challenges that we face. I urge all Americans who supported me to join me, not in just congratulating him, but offering our next president our goodwill and our earnest efforts to find ways to come together, to find the necessary compromises, to bridge our differences and help restore our prosperity, defend our security in a dangerous world, and leave our children and grandchildren a stronger, better country than we inherited. Whatever differences, we are fellow Americans. And please believe me when I say no association has ever meant more to me than that. Tonight, tonight more than any other night, I hold in my heart nothing but love for this country and for all its citizens, whether they supported me or Senator Obama. I wish Godspeed to the man who was my former opponent and will be my president. And I call on all Americans, as I have often done in this campaign, not to despair of our present difficulties, but always to believe in the promise and the greatness of America. Because nothing is inevitable here. Americans never quit. We never surrender. We never hide from history. We make history. So, Paul said, let your manner of life, your politics, your citizenship be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let's figure out what that means together. Amen.
To the Lord's table. I know we miss being able to gather together in this familiar space. We miss being to see each other, but I'm excited that even though we are far away, we can still gather at the Lord's table. We can still have a time to participate together as a community in this act of worship. When Jesus and his disciples gathered around the table, it was a pivotal, pivotal time in Jesus' life and in the ministry and life of his disciples. The disciples had no clue what was coming. They had no clue about the hurt and the pain and the disappointment and the fear that was ahead of them. Jesus having a clue about what his disciples were getting into, decided to offer them a reminder, to offer them a safe space, to offer them a guidance as they moved along through these uncertain times. So the scripture tells us that on the night when they gathered, Jesus took the bread. After he blessed it, he broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Scripture says in the same manner he took the cup. After he blessed it, he poured it and said, this cup represents the new covenant. For as often as you drink this cup and you eat this bread, you remember my ministry, you remember my life, you remember that I am with you in the time of pain in a time of hurt, in a time of fear, in a time of discouragement. Those same words echoes to you and I today. It echoes to us as a community of faith. It echoes to us as a country. It echoes to us as individuals. That no matter how uncertain these times are, no matter what the fear is, no matter what our frustrations and anger are. Jesus is with us. And by participating in this bread and this cup, we remember that. We remind ourselves and we remind each other as we eat the bread and drink the cup. We remind ourselves that we are not alone. Christ is with us. We remind ourselves that we are not alone. That we are there as a community for each other. For everyone, Lord, a place. 
grace at the table for everyone born clean water and bread a shelter a space a safe place for growing for everyone born a star overhead and God will delight when we are creators of justice joy, compassion, and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice. Justice and joy for woman and man, a place at the table, revising the roles, deciding to share. Wisdom and grace, dividing the power for woman and man, a system that's fair. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators. Justice and joy for young and for old, a place at the table, a voice to be heard, a part in the song, the hands of a child, and hands that are wrinkled for young and for old. So let us now eat the bread and drink the cup. The body of Christ broken for you. The cup of God's love and God's presence. Depart now in the company of Christ the Creator, and as you go, remember, 
By the goodness of God, you were born into this world. By the grace of God, you've been kept all day long, even unto this hour. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed. Amen.